with Lucy Ellett and um, as you said, Chris and I um, both work for Archaeology Services, which is the contracts division um, of the Institute of Archaeology at University College London. We're going to talk to you today about the site of Medmory, which is located on the um, on the Selsey Peninsula in West Sussex in South East Britain. Um, this area has been subject to dynamic coastal processes throughout the Holocene and increased storm magnitude and frequency has begun to pose a threat to local businesses and homes. Historic sources demonstrate that tensions between the natural and the man-made environment or landscapes are not new. Medmory Farm was washed into the sea in 1900 and the train line from Selsey to Chichester was repeatedly flooded in the same period. Storms in 2008, as you can see here, at, well, at the top, um, caused extensive flooding to the caravan park and local farmland, resulting in loss of viable land for business. Now, the exact configuration of the Selsey coastline in the Holocene is not, um, is not fully understood. Research has demonstrated, though, that along the peninsula, the coastline has retreated by at least 316 metres in the last 237 years. That's at a rate of 1.3 metres a year. Offshore deposits shown to the south of the peninsula here um, of mix and rock are thought to have played a role in the paleogeography of this area and may in fact have afforded a level of protection for this section of coastline and the erosion. Quarrying of this rock uh, took place in the early 19th century and was thought to have exacerbated coastal erosion to the extent that it was actually banned in 1827. To the east of this site, you can see that there is a shallow tidal lagoon at Pagham Harbour. And this is home to an um, RSPB reserve. This reserve provides some protection, again, from the sea from surrounding properties. And to the north of the site, we have Chichester Harbour. Now, the Environment Agency designed a programme of managed coastal realignment, whereby a large area of land was to be used to capture flood water and in turn prevent um, the flooding of adjacent areas. The top two images shown here show before and after this scheme was implemented. The scheme had three objectives. Sustainable flood risk management, uh, maximising habitat creation areas for wildlife and for birds, and community involvement. Now there was initial opposition from the local community uh, to the scheme, who ideally really wanted a big wall that would just prevent the sea from coming in. There's obviously been a move away from such um, hard flood management schemes, and coastal realignment schemes um, are being implemented in several areas around Britain. By working with the local community through a series of open days and training sessions for members of the local archaeological groups, the attitudes towards the scheme have changed significantly. And as Chris will outline later, our archaeological research has also benefited in the process. Our paleoenvironmental work and archaeological work at the site is beginning to show that the large wetland reserve created during the scheme, shown at the top right, bears an uncanny resemblance to the landscape at points during its history. The work reveals that the dynamic environment that has, <coughs> has serious effects on the local community today was also a major influence on how, where and when people lived in the past in this area. Archaeological investigations and study areas uh, were confined to areas of impact and these were defined by habitat creation areas, borrow pits for the extraction of material to create the flood banks shown <coughs> in black around the grey area, as well as a network of ditches. Geophysical survey, archaeological trial trenching, broadbrush auger survey and open area excavations were all undertaken. And archaeological features were excavated by hand and sampled for environmental analysis. As a result of the initial auger survey, areas were then chosen that were likely to preserve uh, deeper sequences, or deepest sequences I should say, and further hand augering was carried out in order to generate deposit models and to take <coughs> samples for analysis. An extensive programme of C14 dates have been obtained and um, some Bayesian modelling has been undertaken. We're currently at the point of going into our full analysis of this material, um, but I'll pass you over to my colleague Chris now, who will talk about some of the results and legacies of this project. 
Lucy has sent, um, we did a bit broad brush auger survey, and I think one of the main focuses of this project, as we went along, became clear that whilst there was interesting archaeological remains, it was actually the paleo-environmental resource that was really the biggest area of significance. So through the auger survey, um, we managed to identify that in the deepest areas, which are shown in blue, um, we recovered a, a thin peat deposit at the, extents of, um, at the base of extensive mineralogenic accumulation. That was probably developed uh, as a response to uh, initial rapid sea level rise um, in the early Holocene. The dating of this deposit indicates a late Mesolithic date for the onset of accumulation. Um, and other isolated uh, pockets of peat across the site suggest that this peat formation had probably ceased by at least the late Neolithic, which is sort of confirmed at other sites along the south coast. Um, through the analysis of the peat through pollen, plant macrofossils and beetles, um, basically the peat represents the remains of a large freshwater wetland with some oak and hazel woodland occupying the drier areas. And at some point, this is then succeeded by a large brackish lagoon. Now the precise timing of this change is unclear due to the erosive boundary between the sediments. Um, and the lack of sea level index points and offshore paleo work in this area um, make comparisons with regional models of sea level rise difficult, um, particularly with dates from the Solent, which date marine transgressions at dates that range from the late Neolithic um, all the way to the Middle Bronze Age. Um, however, it is probable that by the early Bronze Age, the coastline had become more indented and shingle barriers became an important feature of the paleo topography. Um, the formation of this large lagoon was dependent on some sort of shingle barrier for protection from the open sea. Um, another interesting characteristic of this lagoon, um, through the work by John Whitaker and Tom Hill on things like ostracods for antidiatoms, is demonstrated the complete lack of freshwater input into this system, um, which suggests it to have had the character of the current fleet lagoon in Dorset, which is namely a large, warm, shallow, brackish water body. Identified within these sediments uh, in the lagoon, which are obviously uh, initially tidal but then become much quieter, are two distinct high energy events represented by this mixed shell layer with silt and organics. Um, and again, the work by John Whitaker has demonstrated that this is probably a storm surge event, um, demonstrating that despite this shingle barrier providing some elements of protection for the, for the lagoon, it still was still susceptible to coastal processes. The presence of these storm surge events has clearly removed material from the sediment archive and this has made dating uh, extremely difficult and the precise timings of these, uh, at least two events that we can identify in the coring um, has been difficult to provide decent chronological resolution. At the very least we can say that these events are probably occurring in the late Bronze Age and in the Romano-British period. The archaeological evidence um, has also demonstrated that this shingle barrier instability obviously had an effect on the human occupation of the site, moving it further inland. But the earliest phase of, of human recorded activity at the site is reflected by everybody's favourite, the burnt mound. Um, and I have to defer to Ripper and Beamish's diagram there of what they might have been for. Um, and these were all located along the lagoon edge. Um, and Bayesian modelling has demonstrated the activity may have at least spanned 180 years of the Middle Bronze Age. Um, the function of these particular mounds is not clear, the preservation is not brilliant and difficult to see but this huge spread of stone is obviously extremely deflated and spread out and the troughs were extremely shallow so environmental remains contained in them were not particularly brilliant and they were, we didn't get any nice troughs or linings or anything that might tell us what they were actually used for. Evidence for communities actually living at the site is slightly later um, and is represented by roundhouses and this is one of the big water holes at the site um, which is not actually bottomed in that photo. We had to recover sediments from the bottom using a Russian auger. As you can see, it's full of water. Um, and this lagoon site settlement is suggested by, again, by the modelling to have been occupied for around 155 years. Um, and there seems to be um, a shift in land for the next phase of occupation. Um, which sees dwellings located away from the lagoon edge and towards the north. Despite the problems with the chronology from the lagoon sediments, um, the shift does seem to overlap with some of those storm surge events, um, particularly in the lower parts of the sequence, again, which were dated to the late Bronze Age and the late Iron Age. 
Now, studies on modern environmental assemblages on the possible long-term effects of things like storm surges on freshwater aquifers demonstrate that in some areas it can take up to eight months for a freshwater system to recover, and in severe cases of tsunamis, um, the recovery of the contaminated groundwater can take up to two years. And the scale of the surges at memory is difficult to ascertain, as even these large-scale events can leave a very thin sedimentological trace. But at the very least, we can say that the single barrier must have been overtopped, leading to flooding of the southern extent of the site. And this would have included those water holes and possibly the roundhouses. Um, and obviously these water holes become contaminated with saline water. Um, and the pollen recovered from some of these features did demonstrate the presence of halophytic plant species. Um, and the archaeological record continues to show that from the early Iron Age onwards that the human occupation continues to move further inland. Um, and I haven't put the Romano British remains up, mainly because they're a bit dull, um, but they really did just show a few, the edges of a few field systems and very little else to suggest people were actually living anywhere near this part of the site. It's probably more likely they lived even more further inland um, than, than where the Iron Age settlement is represented. Um, Basically, no further dwellings um, or, or structures are recorded until the late Saxon um, and medieval periods when linear wooden structures began to be um, constructed at the site. Um, the largest of these, which is pictured here, um, dates from the 13th, 14th centuries AD. Um, it's difficult to tell because you can't see it on the surface until you look holes through it, but it was at least 100 metres in length and it went outside of our area of excavation. Um, it's been interpreted as a fish weir, um, but a fish fence might be slightly more appropriate. From this structure in particular, we didn't recover any baskets. As you can see, the wattle portion is extremely um, fragmented. It was only really at the very, very bottom of the structure that we actually got in situ uh, wattle panelling surviving. Um, and it seems like the structure was driven through the upper sediments of this lagoon. Now, unfortunately, due to uh, the oxidation of the upper two metres of sediment across this site, there is no uh, microfossil or macrofossil record contemporaneous with its use. Um, and it is likely that the upper third of the structure had completely rotted away, either by processes of, of desiccation, but also coastal erosion. Um, and we know, obviously, in the medieval period, we have increased storminess, increased magnitude and frequency of storms, possibly may have had a bearing on the stability and preservation of this particular feature. However, there is also a notable absence of any other contemporary medieval features from any of the areas we excavated across the site. And the, the earliest mapping of the area, it dates to the 16th century and doesn't really provide uh, any detail for likely watercourses that uh, may have been present. By the time you get to the 18th century, there's suddenly a channel present at the site. Um, and obviously, wholesale drainage for arable cultivation, which is demonstrated in this lower area here. Um, this has led to the widespread dewatering of the upper part of the sediment archive. Um, so we've probably lost basically everything from the Roman period to now. Um, and obviously this has caused extensive damage to the paleo-environmental and waterlogged archaeological archive. And this continues into the 20th century with the photos you saw earlier of, of lots of farm buildings during storm surge events, demonstrating the continuing vulnerability of the area to coastal processes. Um, I mean, what's been presented here demonstrates the sort of the scope and the potential of the archaeological and the paleo-environmental resource of the peninsula. Um, one of the main legacies of the project by the creation of this managed realignment scheme is that a, a level of baseline data has been able to be gathered as to the level of preservation of remains at the site, both for the paleo-environmental archive and the archaeological archive. And we were fortunate enough um, to be able to collaborate with people actively as the project went along. So we do have a range of data which also includes the modelling, deposit modelling, the deposit records, the environmental records, but also laser scanning carried out by Mike Lobb at Southampton University. So we have a fully digital, three-dimensional model available, which has captured the preservation of that wooden structure as we excavated it. Um, and basically, the scheme itself is actually recreating a large projected lagoon. Um, 
where mud flats have already started to form, providing the habitat for various plants and animal species. And this is um, to be curated by the RSPB. Um, and it does bear striking resemblance to the former Bronze Age character of the landscape. Um, and more widely, the peninsula has started to uh, resemble its prehistoric self. Um, recreating this indented coastline in an attempt to protect other areas of human occupation. Um, and it was just interesting listening to what Ben was saying about, you know, you can't repair the damage done to these archives of archaeological and paleo-environmental resources. <laughs> but obviously, a formerly drained landscape has now been re-wetted. So at least, the very least we can say that that degradation has been halted, at least in the short term. One of the other significant legacies of the project has been the involvement of community groups. Um, we work very closely with the Chichester and District Archaeological Society, um, who are now basically taking ownership of that archaeological and paleo-environmental resource by continuing to monitor the eroded coastline, continuing to record sections, um, and as, as sort of our, part of our responsibility, we've enabled um, them to basically work with us training we've also designed a streamlined recording system so that they can go out everyone takes the same piece of paper with them everyone records basic information they also have and been, been very lucky to have uh, former historic england pete murphy who is helping them to record sediments in a way that is com commensurate with a professional archaeological organization and that collaboration doesn't end because the project is ended we still have those conversations and the picture we can see here is them recovering a fish basket from the eroding foreshore essentially and we were able to help them with that and get that radiocarbon dated but also again with mike laser scan and create records of these things so what we're having we've, we've opened a conversation um, and as part of an, a contracting archaeological unit we will continue to work professionally across the peninsula we will go back to these places so it's it's nice to have a continuing legacy that both sort of helps us as professionals but also allows us to help local community groups take ownership of their own archaeological and environmental landscape um, and I'd just like to thank all the various people who helped us on the project, including all the many specialists who've had conversations with us over the... And oh, can I also say, I also like Pete and Paleo Channels and Pointer Sticks. <laughs>